glad to have you all here still. You didn't run and hide. <laughs> you all having a good day so far? Yeah. Let's see if I can do something about that. Hey. I'm sorry, that's just leftover from Tuesday night. So, um, you know, we always open with a serenity prayer. There's that line in there that says that I might be reasonably happy in this life and then supremely happy with you forever in the next, right? So I say, is everybody reasonably happy? And, you know, yeah. <laughs> right before we start playing, I said, well, let's see if I can do something about that. Make it better. Yeah, maybe. Who knows? Anyway, chapter 6 in Galatians today. We're going to, um, you know, hold on. I hope you're ready. We're geared up. We're going to go, we're going to do all of chapter 6 today. We're going to go through the whole chapter and conclude our study through the book of Galatians today. Um, and um, then you all have a great treat next week to be announced. Uh, so uh, uh, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll see you then, right? Anyway, all right, so chapter 6. Remember, uh, as I just want to recap a little bit, the theme for this letter for context so that you understand, because since we don't just sit down and read it all at once, which you should at least once, just sit down and read the whole thing at once because it was a letter written to a church, to a group of people, right? And you get your context better that way when you stay in it and you... you have the context of the letter because otherwise we can take a little passage out here and there and get the wrong idea because we forgot of the context in which it was written right so um, anyway our context main context is as a Christian our salvation did not come to us by works that we earned by, or the, by works that we did to earn it you do not earn your own salvation you cannot it's something that cannot be bought by man's good deeds it's far more precious than that uh, and God knows that that's the reason for the cross of Christ that's the reason God became flesh and dwelled among us according to John chapter 1 in the beginning the word the word was with God the word was God verse 14 the word became flesh and dwelled among us uh, when we, we give testimony to this word right and then and John goes on and describes all of the things about his best friend Jesus of Nazareth and and that's that's a great book by the way if you want to just jump in and read Read some Bible, the Gospel of John. Grab a hold of that one. It's great. Written from the best friend of Jesus that wrote his biography. It's an awesome book. Anyway, we know that that's who he is. He paid our price for us. You cannot buy it. You have to just trust him. He said, I've got you. When he, when he died on the cross, hanging there, and he said, paid in full, he said, I've got you if you'll trust me. And God says, what I require is that faith that you trust that this works. And if you will, I've got you. That's the hard part. That's why it's not exactly easy because it's hard for us to believe and trust in Him. But once we come to that point and we say, I do, I, I do, I trust that Jesus got this because I'm not good enough and I could never be. I'd keep on blowing it if it was up for me to earn it somehow and then to even maintain it. I would blow it left and right. I, I, I'm so grateful of His grace. The Jews came into Galatia, to the new church, and some of them became believers in Christ. Some of them did not and remained Jewish and went to the synagogue, right? But those Jewish believers in Christ hung on to the law. They just couldn't get a, in their head, they couldn't get their mind wrapped around that they could be made right with God simply by trusting in Jesus. I've got to do these religious things or I can't be right with God, right? That's their mentality because that's how they were raised. That's what the Jewish religious system had become. Uh, it lost the idea that it's still, it was always supposed to be by faith. Abraham, their forefather, it says in the book of Hebrews that he believed God. And that was credited to him as righteousness. Okay, that's the reason their father Abraham was righteous. Before any of the law, he didn't have the law. He was 400 and some odd years before his descendant Moses brought the law. 
right? So Abraham didn't have the law. He didn't have any of that stuff. It was before the ritual rite of circumcision to mark them as a set-apart group of people. It was before that he was credited with, righteous, with righteousness because he believed God. So the whole time it was about that. But the Jewish religion had become accustomed to living according to their rules. And the mindset became, I'm right with God if I live by these rules. And you see, much of the church today is the same way. People think, you know, uh, I can be right with God if I go by religious rules. And, and the people in the church say, well, you've got you to gotta attend church. You've got to tithe. You've got to not say these words anymore, and we'll have a list of them. And by the way, those li that list needs to be updated every generation, right? You know, because there's new words. You know, but whatever. I won't talk like that, and I won't do that, and I won't do this, and I won't do that, and I won't do that, and it's about that. Then I can be identified as belonging to God be right with him. It's not about any of that. It's not about that at all. That's why this book of Galatians was written to explain. It's not about those things. Last chapter we talked about the marks of a life led by the old nature, the debauchery. And there's a whole list of things we went over last Sunday that are like those things that are, the, those are the marks of a life that doesn't, has not been saved. And then there was another list, which is the fruit of the Spirit, which is the produce or the, the fruit of the life of salvation. And we saw that one. And, and, and Paul was saying, you see, these are ways to kind of judge whether or not you're in or, or you're not. Is, does your life start to look more like this uh, and not like that, right? So anyway, now, the final chapter in this book, we're going to kind of wrap it all up. But unlike so many other of Paul's letters, it doesn't have like a half a chapter of greet so-and-so and greet so-and-so and say hi to that guy and tell Aunt B I said hey, you know. <laughs> Come on, Andy Griffith people? <laughs> anyway, uh, it, it doesn't have that stuff. Some of Paul's letters have that, at the, that kind of thing at the end. Greet so-and-so. This one doesn't have that. It's pretty much just good stuff right to the last verse. So we're going to do that today. Are you ready? Here we go. Verses 1 and 2. Brothers... If someone is caught in a sin, you who are spiritual should restore him gently, but watch yourself, or you also may be tempted. Carry each other's burdens, and in this way you will fulfill the law of Christ. Galatians 6, 1, that first verse, is a memory verse or a support verse in the Christian 12-step program. The, uh, the, the thing, it, it, it backs up step 12, uh, you know, and um, this Tuesday night, I, I kind of shared with them, this past Tuesday night, this section that I'm going to share with you right now. I want you to look at those verses. Check those verses out. Brothers, if someone is caught in a sin, most of the time, if you grew up in church like I did, and you just kind of been around church your whole life, you've heard this verse before. You were probably had it as a memory verse as a kid or something like that. And you probably always thought that this caught meant somebody caught you. Right? I mean, there's two ways you can take this. If someone is caught in a sin like the woman who was caught in the very act of adultery. Really, were they peeping toms? Voyeurs is what they were. They're watching. That's the only way they could catch her in the act of adultery, right? And where's her partner? Where's the dude? Where's he and all that? No, he was their buddy. They let him go. They drug her out there, threw her in the dirt in front of Jesus, says, hey, Jesus. And these were the Pharisees, right? The religious folk. She was just caught in the very act of adultery. What do we do with her? Uh, the law says to stone her to death. What do you say? And Jesus, shining as bright as ever, said, you know what, you're going to learn something today, guys. And he stooped down and started drawing in the dirt. And he says, uh, yeah, the law says that. And let you among you who is without sin throw the first stone. As he's drawing in the dirt. The scripture doesn't say what he drew in the dirt. I've always thought he was listing off things that they were each guilty of. 
And as they saw their own pet sin there, the thing, and they were moved and convicted by it. And one by one, they walked away, realizing, I'm not without sin. He's giving them the hard lesson of, yeah, this could be for all of you, except for my grace. And so as they all walked away, he looks up at the woman and he says, Woman, where are your accusers? <laughs> and I always like the smiling Jesus in, in the actor that, that Bruce Marciano plays Jesus in a lot of those movies and he smiles a lot. I love that guy. I think he's the best actor to play Jesus ever. But anyway, he, uh, he smiles and he says, Where are your accusers? Like you'd expect to, to see Jesus do, right? And she says, They've all left, sir. And he says, Neither do I condemn you. Who there in the crowd was without sin? Jesus, Jesus the scripture says, was without sin. He could have picked up the stone and thrown the first stone, according to his little rule that he said. He said, neither do I condemn you. Now, he didn't say, it's okay, keep doing what you're doing. He said, go and sin no more. But I don't condemn you. You see, that's the picture of Jesus the church needs to see more of. That's the picture of Jesus the world needs to see the church modeling more of. He said, neither do I condemn you. Quit sinning. I'm going to go and make some wine. Want some? <laughs> No, I don't want any wine. I'm talking, that's, he did, he made it. I can't, you know, I can't make wine. Anyway. So anyway, view this, if someone is caught in a sin, now you're wondering, how's he going to get through this whole chapter if he's going to take this long to get two verses, right? <laughs> I promise you it'll pick up, all right? Uh, okay, verse 1, I want you to get that, though, because it's often missed. This is not caught in the way of someone caught them doing it. This is caught in the way a fish gets caught in a net. Or an insect gets caught in the spider's web. And that's an accurate one right there. Imagine a spider's web and your brother's in it and caught and he can't get out. That's the context of this verse. If your brother is caught in his sin, you who are spiritual, this phrase is hard to understand too because it's the English translation of it makes us think, I'm a spiritual one, right? I'm all good. I can do my superior dance. Like, like you know, the church lady, Dana Carvey, remember that? Isn't that special? All right, I'm glad you, you know. It, okay, that's not who is spiritual. Not in their own, it's... it's you are spiritual, meaning you, if you are being led by the Spirit right now to do so, you go help your brother out. If you don't have that burden from the Holy Spirit to go, then you stay out of it. You who are spiritual should restore him gently. Because you know why? If you're not spiritual, if you're not led by the Spirit, you're not going to be gentle. You're going to go in there and say, dude, what's up with you? You're stupid. Right? Why do you keep doing stupid stuff? Right? Forrest Gump said, well, stupid is as stupid does. You know, I mean, you're going to take that attitude with someone, and are you going to get very far with them with that attitude? No, you're not. It's not going to go very far. But, but if you're led by the Spirit, you're going to have the fruit of the Spirit that we just read in the last chapter, love, joy, peace, patience, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control when you go to restore this guy. That's going to come out from you. Not condemnation, which is the devil's job. It's not our job anyway. Okay? You go and help him out. And be careful when you're there because you might be tempted to get involved. Right? But that you're going to have to go in among there where he's at. You're going to have to go in where he's at and be a part of that in order to help restore him. Pharisees will say, you can't even go do that. you got to stay away from those people. You can't go where they go. You can't eat with them. You can't eat at the same table. You can't do any of that stuff, right? That was the religious people's point of view. Paul said, no, you go in there and you saddle up next to him. Say, dude, I'm here to help you out. Tell me about it. What's going on, man? Right? Isn't that much more gentle? I'm here to help. I'm here to be your friend. Uh, 
That's what the world needs to see more of. Jesus, I don't condemn you. I'm not condemning you. I don't even have to say go and sin no more because you already know you're a brother. You have the Spirit in you because it said if a brother, someone is caught in sin. He's talking about the brothers. So anyway, so here's the thing. Restore. There's, the, there's a Greek lesson here. The word restore is katartizo. Yeah, it's hard to say. Katartizo. Um, it's the same word that's used for mending the nets for the fishermen when they would go out and fix the nets. They mend. Or the word they would use if they set a broken bone. Katartizo was the Greek word. That's the word that Paul used when he said this. You're going to help mend. You're not in there saying, stop it or turn or burn, right? That's what the church shakes a finger at people all the time and says, turn or burn. Turn around and stop doing what you're doing or you're going to go to hell. Hell's got like three syllables in it when they say it like that. Hey, hell, you know, you're going to go. <laughs> anyway. So, if you see a fellow believer slipping into sin, or caught in it, stuck in it, and you're led by the Spirit, not the flesh, you're burdened by the Holy Spirit to help him, restore him gently. Not with gossip. And here's another lesson. I mean, I could almost go the full hour just on this. But I, I won't. But uh, not with gossip, but a goal to restore. Remember that cartizio, catartizo, yeah. Restore, to fix it. He's a brother, goes to your church probably, has a testimony, right? When did the church ever get this idea that someone slips and falls, they've got to stand up and get behind a microphone so it's loud enough that everyone can hear and they tell all the nitty gritty details of how they blew it and everyone knows all of the details. Where do they ever get the idea that that kind of thing had to happen? It's wrong, it's from the devil actually, because how do those people ever look at that guy again? <laughs> if they're not used to it. Now, you hang around with people that are slipping a lot. You start to get used to it. I'm, you might say I'm calloused. I'm not calloused. I'm just more used to it. It doesn't shock me as much anymore when I hear that someone stuck a needle in their arm and they hadn't for a long time. But they did over the week because something tempted them. They were down. They were depressed. Whatever the reason was, they did it. And they're feeling horrible about it. And they're not going to continue. They, they're already stopping, you know. And, 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 and I'm there going, all right, dude, what do we do from here then? Just, just get back up on that bike and ride. Right? I'm not going to go announcing it to everybody. That's gossip. It's not my story to tell. Right? Gossip's one of the sins that's listed and condemned in Scripture, by the way, that the church just winks at because it, there are so many professional gossips in the church. They shoot their own wounded. Right? The only army in the whole history of the planet that shoots their own wounded is the army of Christ, right? Supposedly. But not the true army of Christ. Because they'll keep it small. They won't be telling everybody about it. They're going to keep it as small as it... No bigger than it has to be. Sometimes someone has to be talked to. Someone has to be told. But no bigger than it has to be at all. And you know what? It's probably not your job to decide how big that, is, that bubble is. It's going to be up to the person who's hurting, probably. If there's someone they've damaged, they, they need to go to that person and make amends. That's part of the 12-step anyway, right? But, but keeping it as small as possible, that's the only way you're going to restore a brother to the church. If you just keep on loving them and you don't condemn them, right? The picture of Jesus next to the woman in the dirt. That's what we need to be seeing more of. The goal to restore means that you will guard the brother from damage to his testimony during this time of disease. Because it's disease. This time of disease, the brother has slipped into some kind of sin. The sin is a disease, right? You're going to help him, guarding him from the more further damage to his testimony during because of the time of his disease. Carry each other's burdens doesn't mean to remove their responsibility. And by the way, chapter 2, I mean not chapter, verse 2 always should accompany verse 1 here. Because you're carrying that burden. You're helping them carry that burden when you go to help to restore them. Because it is a burden to hear that about somebody sometimes. When you hear what they just did, sometimes it's a heavy burden. 
because now all of a sudden you know something about them and if you've got an inkling to be a gossip you're wanting to tell somebody right you've all heard the joke about the people that shared their their pet sin well I've got a real sin for this and the second guy says I've got a real sin for doing this and the third guy says well my sin's gossip and I can't wait to tell everybody what you guys do right <laughs> Unfortunately, you know, that person should not be the one that goes to help restore somebody because they can't keep it to themselves. They're not trustworthy. They love telling someone else's story. Their life is so miserable that they have none of their own. All right, keep it to yourself. Carry each other's burdens. Um, it, 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 it doesn't mean that you're going to take away their responsibility, they, you're, but you're going to help them get under it. You're going to help them live up to their responsibility is what you're going to do. Help them get there. Help them go through that. Uh, we will have burdens that will require the help of others. Right? Happens all the time. But this one is speaking to the heavy load of guilt and shame that come from slipping into sin or out of fellowship with God. There's a heavy load of guilt and shame that we feel when that happens. And, and, and we'll be called on sometimes to help that, burden, that person and help carry that burden. And the only way you're going to do it is to help minimize it. Keep it as small as possible. It's going to happen. Things are going to happen because people have an old nature. And as long as we have the old nature, something's bound to happen from time to time. So don't get all crazy when it does and think, oh no, the sky has fallen. It's just a symptom of the fact that we have a fallen nature until we move along out of this body. We'll always have that nature until that day. That's why that's our big hope of that day. We won't have that nature anymore. That's something to hope for. But until then, we might have to help each other bear that burden and keep it, you know, as small as possible. The law of Christ is to love your neighbor as yourself. And Paul also wrote, love covers over a multitude of sin. If you're loving, you can cover over it somehow. Uh, and, you know, if it needs to be something that they need to go to jail for, well, you know, I'm personally not the one that's the arresting party. There are some things that I might be mandated and have to report on. But that's usually not the kind of thing that i am become privy to. So, um, anyway... Love, of, uh, love your neighbor as yourself is, is what's called for in this. And Jesus taught that. Verses 3 through 5. If anyone thinks he is something when he's nothing, he deceives himself. Each one should test his own actions. Then he can take pride in himself without comparing himself to somebody else. For each one should carry his own load. Well, now, see, I've always said the Bible's full of contradictions. Right there, you just read it. Right? Did you catch it? The previous verse said, carry each other's burdens. This one says, each man should carry his own load. Is the Bible contradicting itself? No. Was Paul contradicting himself? No. Context is king. You have to remember what he's talking about here. We are to help carry the burden of restoration and, and when someone is slipping and struggling with it, with it, we are to help carry that burden. But when we're talking, when he shifts gears here and he starts talking about who am I comparing myself to? I've got to carry my own load in that. I'm guilty for what I'm guilty for and I can't keep blaming it on somebody else. Maybe you have a problem with that. I know there are a lot of people who do. When you do something wrong, well, it's because of this, or it's because of that. And you have to find justification for yourself. Jesus is the one that justifies us. Quit trying. He's the one that makes you right with God. You're not going to blame it on somebody. Blaming it on somebody or something else isn't going to justify you. You've already been justified with God. You need to just own it. And if you're guilty of something, you're guilty of it, period, plain and simple. But Jesus has saved me, so it don't matter in the grand scheme of things. It might matter here. I might have to pay the consequences for what I did here. But in God's economy, I've already been covered for it. 
So why am I having such a hard time just saying, yeah, I'll own that. I did that. You know, if you did, you know, and quit trying to blame it and shift blame on somebody else for it. Right? That's a character flaw of people, I think, is to always try to say, well, you made me. Or remember Flip Wilson in the, in the thing, the devil made me do it? You know, we can't blame the devil for everything. Sure, he antagonizes us and he gets involved and he po pokes at us all the time and everything, but we still have to, if we did it, we did it. He might have talked us into it, but we still are guilty. Right? It doesn't remove our, guilty, our guilt by blaming someone else. Take it. But back here, the, the first, verse 3, if anyone thinks he's something when he's nothing, he deceives himself. You know, I, I heard this old phrase, if you could buy them for what they're really worth and sell them for what they think they're worth, you'll make a profit. <laughs> That was an old timer saying, and I, that's pretty good, because they're. I, I know some people like that. If I could buy them uh, for what they're really worth and sell them for what they think they're worth, hey, there's 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 profit margin in that. I'd open up a business anyway. Paul isn't saying that some Christians aren't somethings when he says if someone thinks he's something and he's nothing, no, he's just using these generalities, right? Like we might use them. You really think you're something, don't you? Anyway, but really he's telling us all to assume we're nothing, to not assume more than you ought. If you assume you're nothing, then anything comes your way is going to be a something, right? In Philippians chapter 2, verses 3 through 9, Paul wrote, and it's another letter, we'll get to that later on, next year. Um, uh, Philippians 2, 3 through 9, Paul wrote, Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility consider others better than yourselves. Each of you should look not only to your own interests, but also to the interests of others. Your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus, who, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man. He humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on the cross. Therefore, God exalted him. So if you just go about it, just go ahead and think you're nothing. I'm nothing. I know I'm something in God's eyes. I know I'm worthy of something because He wanted me and He loves me. And that gives me value. Okay? But too many people take that too far. And you go around with a puffed up chest, walking around, I'm a child of the king, and I'm going to start giving orders and blah, 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 blah. And I'm going to start naming it and claiming it and blabbing it and grabbing it. And I'm going to go and, you know, and, and all this kind of stuff because I'm a child of the most high. Well, you are, and he loves you. But the humble nature of Christ never acted like that. He considered himself lowly enough to wash his disciples' feet, as we, dis as we talked about in Sunday school, even Judas's. Right? He even washed his feet. Placed himself in a position to be lifted up by someone other than himself. That's the lesson from Paul here. Let God do it. Let God lift you up and elevate you. It'll mean something then. So, if we would stop lifting ourselves up so much, maybe the Lord would lift us up after we've marinated in humility for a little while. You ever marinated in humility? Yeah. Some, sometimes we need to marinate it in a little further. Verse 6. Anyone who receives instruction in the Word must share all good things with his instructor. Okay, I'm not going to spend too much time on this because pastors don't like to talk about their support in congregation because it makes them feel self, you know, talking about, you know, I'm worth this and you guys don't think so, you know, whatever, you start talking like that. But really, Paul, is this is his plug for pastoral support, okay? It, the idea here is that pastors should be supported by those benefiting from their teaching in order to be able to devote the time needed without having to work outside the church. It's sad when a pastor has to work outside the church to make the rest of the ends meet. That's a sad thing. 
thing. Uh, and he obviously will not be able to have as much time devoted as he could otherwise. Um, but, you know, sometimes that's all there is. And if you are in ministry, you understand you're going to keep on doing it anyway, even if you're not getting paid. Because you're called to do it. And, you know, but the right thing is for the church to do the right thing. And that's Paul's plug here. Uh, supports the financial support of pastors, but also tells us where our primary giving is to go. Because uh, some people say, well, I give to this outfit, and I give to that outfit, and I give to this, and then if there's something left, I'll give it to the church. You know, the primary place the giving is to be your local church, where you're being fed, where you're learning in the Word. That's where it's supposed to go. If you want to give to other ministries, also on top of that, be, be sure to support your church first, and then go by all means. Then it can be called an offering, because you don't do offering until after you've tithed. All right, that's the real definition. Uh, it's not an offering until you've met the, the tithe quota. You know, that's, that's tithing. And um, most of us never make it quite all the way to the tithe. And um, yet we'll call everything we give an offering, and it's just, yeah, okay, it's vernacular, but it's not correct. Uh, the offering is that which is above and beyond what is required. It's just of a willing heart, okay? All right, verses 7 and 8. Uh, do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. A man reaps what he sows. The one who sows to please his sinful nature, from that nature will reap destruction. The one who sows to please the Spirit, from the Spirit will reap eternal life. Um, He's reminding his readers again of the law of sowing and reaping. Uh, he's talked about that before. The reminder comes from uh, right on the tails of the exhortation to support the pastors. Um, and so that is your closest context verse right there. The idea behind his wording is that withholding support for your pastor is sowing to the flesh selfishness. But sharing with those in the ministry of the Word is sowing to the Spirit. And that's, that's why he puts that verse right on the other. You know, it's like a, an explanation of what he just said in verse 6. So 7 and 8 are backing up 6 is what's happening there. Now, let's go on to um, uh, Oh, I have one last little comment there. This is not to say that if you fail to support your pastor, you won't go to heaven, but it should. <laughs> Kidding. I have an LOL written on the other. There. And sure enough, I got some LOLs out of you. Anyway, all right, verses 9 and 10. Let us not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all people, especially to those who belong to the family of believers. See, we, we don't always see the fruit of our labor. That's okay. Sometimes it seems like we've wasted our efforts. Believe me, I was in youth ministry for 17 years. And a lot of times, it feels like you've wasted your efforts. Especially when as soon as they get old enough to have wheels, they're gone and you never see them again. I've wasted my efforts. But not really. You might be met in a grocery store many years later by one of them who'll say, Hey, remember me? I just wanted to let you know that you made a big difference in my life. And the things that you taught me... They really did help. And I always, I still remember some of the things you taught me. And they'll quote something you said, and you don't even remember it. I said, that, well, that sounds pretty cool. You know? <laughs> Years later, and it's like a reminder of, okay, well, I thought my efforts were completely in vain, but I guess not. There, there was something that came out of that. You might. And then again, you may never hear that from anybody. But I'm standing here as one who did hear it a few times. Uh, I have heard it every now and then I hear that. And so those 17 years with the kids, with the teenagers, you know, that might have seemed at the time like, I don't know, I'm spinning my wheels with these guys. They don't, they don't care, <laughs> you know. Yeah, some of them did. Even though they acted on the surface like they didn't, you don't know what's going on down beneath. Same goes in everything else we do in life. Don't get tired of doing the good that you ought to do, because you don't know. In the proper time, you'll receive a harvest. If God decides you need a little harvest in this life, 
keep you your faith boosted, then he'll maybe give you some of it, a little here and there. But it may be in the next life where all the harvest comes out, and that's okay too. Right? But it is nice to get a little something now and then here so that you realize, okay, I'll keep on. I'll keep going then. Uh, all right. Because uh, the devil likes to talk to you and say, you're wasting your time. Give up. Just stop. Don't think for a second I don't hear that a lot. The devil talks to me all the time. I have to remember. It, it's hard to keep remembering he's a liar. Because sometimes he'll tell you something that you know is true. But he'll twist it in a way. He'll take truth and make it into a lie somehow. Anyway. Notice um, we don't always see the fruit of our labor our way. Sometimes it takes a long time. But when it comes to doing the good that the Spirit has led us to do, the things that the Word of God has instructed us to do, we will reap a harvest because the law of sowing and reaping is a guarantee. And notice the priority is given to the fellow believers in this one. Uh, we do re need to remember that. We're to go do good everywhere as often as we can to everyone. Because you know why? Even if that person's not a believer, we always ought to put the word yet on the end of that statement. They may not be a believer yet. If you just keep on loving them into the kingdom, right? Just be kind, be brotherly to all people. You never know who might be sitting in the pews with you later on in church. And, and when you first met them, you had no idea that would ever happen. You know, but hey, then there they are. You just don't know. So you just keep on in your labor. Uh, in in, in light labor. It's not hard labor necessarily all the time. By the way, following the Spirit is, once you're in it, the work is never really that hard. Sometimes it's enjoyable. Sometimes you can be enjoying it while you're doing it. Remember that too. So anyway, we are to do good to everyone, but when it comes to one or the other, the believer is to get first service because they are our family now. So they'll get first service, but we just don't stop with them. We keep on with everyone else as well. Um, verse 11, Paul says, See what large letters I, I use as I write to you with my own hand. Remember back in the beginning, uh, he says, uh, um, I, I was given a thorn in my flesh. You know, anyway, he talks about he has a thorn in his flesh. And um, we always wonder about, because of so many other hints, we know it was probably his eyesight. And here we are, verse 11, something to do with his eyesight was, was off. And this guy went into an island one time, and he went preaching among the people of that island, and so many were sick and infirmed. And the scripture in the book of Acts says... Everyone who was sick was healed. That's an amazing verse to me because everyone on that island that had any disease or sickness was healed. With Paul as the agent of the healing, the one who was there giving it to them. This is the Apostle Paul. Many miracles have been done by this guy. Many, many, many miracles. But yet he's given a problem with his eyes. And he can't name it and claim it and blab it and grab it and command their eyes to be new again. You know, he, he couldn't do that. He pleaded with the Lord many times, take this sight from this, this problem away from me. And the Lord said, my grace is sufficient for you. That's in 2 Corinthians. He tells about that one. Um, the Lord told him, my grace is enough for you. You just keep on going. Uh, also in uh, chapter 4, verses 15, he says, I know that you would have torn out your own eyes for me. You cared. And he makes that statement to the Galatian people that they did have some care there. So, so he's writing with big letters with it because he's, he's saying that he's writing this with his own hand. Usually he had a scribe writing for him. But at this point, for whatever reason, he wrote some of it with his own hand. Look at what, you know, anyway. All right, so on to verse 12 through 12 and 13. Those who want to make a good impression outwardly are trying to compel you to be circumcised. The only reason they do this is to avoid being persecuted for the cross of Christ. Not even those who are circumcised obey the law. Yet they want you to be circumcised that they may boast about your flesh. 
They don't even keep the law themselves. Back to the beginning, when I said it's the Judaizers, the Jewish background Christians that have come into the church and said, but we all got to act like Jews too. So that means you guys all ought to become Jews, get, get circumcised. And remember, a lot of the Greek people, that was not something that was practiced when they were youth. This would be a grown man having to get circumcised. Now, there won't be a, that won't be a very big line. <coughs> If there's a line to stand in line to sign up to do that, grown men aren't going to get in that line. Let me tell you. You know, and these people were saying, but you have to. If you, if you want Christ, you're not going to be accepted unless you're... See, that's just more garbage thrown on them. And he's saying, look, don't listen to them. They're, they're saying that that's keeping the law because the law required that of them, but they don't even keep the law. They might be circumcised, but they break the law all the time. So don't listen to it. It's not about the law. You're free, right? Uh, if, if you understand what's going on here, then, then the legalism has fleshly motives. Paul is saying these guys, the only reason they want that to be happening is so that their fellow Jews who might be going to synagogue across the street or whatever, they're still in the same town, and they would still want to be friends with them, they don't want their fellow Jews to persecute them, make fun of them, call them names or whatever they might do, or, or not do business with them or whatever. It's different forms of persecution, right? But they want to avoid the persecution themselves, so if who they're hanging out with and going to church with are all starting to get circumcised, then they're avoiding this persecution from the fellow Jews. See, that's the only reason they want to do it. And I, and I got to tell you, that is the reason so many people in legalistic churches want to spread their legalism. And the only reason they even stand up to the legalism themselves is so they won't be persecuted or looked down upon by the ones who are doing it. For some people, it comes very easy to look all proper and to dress up right and to have the right diet and all these kinds of things and be that proper Christian kind of person. It comes very easy to them. They never do anything wrong. You ever had a sibling like that or something? Never does anything wrong. Why can't you be more like Jesus? I'm sure James and the other brothers heard that a lot. Why can't you be more like your older brother Jesus? Well, he's God, uh, you know, but... <laughs> I'm not going to be, you know, I'll try to be like him, but I'm not him. Uh, but I mean, you know, it, 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 there are some people in the church that keeping all these rules, it comes easy for them. They have no problem doing that. But if they're the church lady, right? If they're looking at everybody else saying, oh, what gives us these ideas? Maybe it's Satan, you know? I can do my superior dance because I don't do all that, right? And, and I want to, if you want to join in with the superior dance and to get in on it with them, you don't want to be persecuted or to have them look down their nose on it, so you're going to get in with it too. That's the reason many people join in to the legalistic lifestyle that the church so gladly jumps into so much of the time. It's because they don't want the persecution from the ones who are like that. And legalists in general don't even keep their own laws completely. That's the truth of the matter. They just have a resemblance of keeping it to avoid persecution from other legalists. They're usually hiding some of it in the background that, that I would just say, why are you hiding it? Right? Why are you hiding it? It's legalism in the first place. There's nothing to be ashamed of there. You're free. The reason for recruiting uh, these legalists, the reason for their recruiting, trying to get others to join in with them, is not out of, sense of, out of a sense of love or concern for the others uh, or spiritual well-being, um, but it's to collect trophies, basically. Look how many we got to join our ranks. That's really the reason for it. There's an old phrase, nickels and noses. Have you ever heard this one before? Uh, a lot of, it describes the mentality in leaders a lot of the time. Um, conversation in a group of church leaders can always lead to nickels and noses. Oh, how many you got coming to your church? Oh. Right? You know, you're among a bunch of pastors at a retreat somewhere. How many you got, what's your annual budget these days? I've been asked that. But you guys know me. I said, I don't know. I don't remember. 
And I don't. I'm being honest. How many of you got coming to your church? I really want to say, none of your business. Why are you so nosy? And really, I say, I say, nah, good crowd. <laughs> I don't count. I know some people do the counting and they do some stuff like that so we can put it in, in the bullet, you know, for whatever reason. But I don't care. I don't count. I mean, I count in Jesus' eyes, but I don't... Nah, never mind. I don't do the counting. Okay. But I'm, yeah. Um, nickels and noses is the whole reason for this whole thing. They, they, and that's what Paul is trying to say. They're trying to get you in on it. What's your budget? What's your, how many people you got going? Well, we got these people to get circumcised. Check us out, you know. That's the same kind of thing that they were doing there. Even if they don't mean to make you feel bad for having less than them... <laughs> Their reason for these questions is really only so they can compare themselves to something and maybe feel better about themselves. Oh, his annual budget's only this much. Mine's a lot bigger than that. He's only got this many going to his church. I got three times that going to my church. Sometimes I want to say, I wonder how many people in your church are going to hell. <laughs> I hope none. But are you giving the word to them? Because ah, it's been my experience, a lot of times, a lot of people run away when you start doing that. Verses 14 to 16. May I never boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, though through which the world has been crucified to me, and I to the world. Neither circumcision nor uncircumcision means anything. What counts is a new creation. Peace and mercy to all who follow this rule, even to the Israel of God. You see, it was, it was the work our Lord did in embracing His cross uh, to set us free that uh, we should be proud of. We should be proud of Him for that. Nothing, nothing that we have accomplished through works of the flesh, certainly. Paul didn't care about worldly success or status among men. He was in touch with the fact that nothing of his own, of his own work anyway, meant anything, only what the Lord had done through him and was doing and would do through him. That's what meant something. And we would do well to remember this ourselves. Nothing we accomplish by our own, our own ability or hard work uh, leaves this world. It's all carnal and temporary. The only thing that should matter is what lasts forever, what transfers into eternity. And only what our Lord does can do that. What's done through Him and what He does through us. All we can hope to contribute is a willing obedience to let Him work through us. Then those things that uh, we hope for will have eternal results. And there will be something that you can take into attorney with you. Our work, circumcision or not, that has nothing to do with it. It's all just our work, if it's our work. Only what His work through us is the only thing that really matters. Now the last phrase, even to the Israel of God, this is the last, the last phrase here um, in, in this chapter. Um, even to the Israel of God has been controversial in some people because it's a hinge for covenant theology and amillennialists. You've probably heard those phrases, those terms. Amillennialists, people don't believe in the millennial reign of Christ. They think we're somehow spiritually in it already. Um, you know, uh, and, and they don't think that it's literally going to happen, even though Scripture says it is very literally. Um, also, the, uh, the other one, um, um, <clears throat> covenant theology, that's the other one, um, follows this, this, um, this misinterpretation of even to the Israel of God. For them, they have a view, have you heard of the uh, replacement theology? Any, ever, any of you ever heard that term? Uh, it's the idea that in Scripture somehow everything that was referring to Israel after the cross of Christ transfers to the church. And the church has become Israel. 
That's replacement theology, like the church has replaced Israel. But that's not good theology, because that leaves a whole bunch of promises undone. And that would make God one who doesn't fulfill all of his promises. So it's bad. And so this verse here, taken out of context, is a hinge for both of those two errant theologies. Uh, because if they, if they take it to mean the Israel of God is us, no. Even to the Israel of God, mean not just the church, but to Israel as well. See, that's really the context of how this verse is set. And I know you guys are like, I don't care, just get to it. Yeah, all right. Um, all that aside, even to the Israel of God, the NIV, in the NIV, the word chi means um, even or also or likewise. Okay, so, but the gist is that more than one group was being mentioned. Okay, so if you're going to break down in grammar and all that stuff, multiple groups are being mentioned. And that chi ties them, but it's two groups. It's not the same group. Does that help anything at all? Is meaning that the, 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 the church has not become the Israel of God. It's the church even also the Israel of God. They're two different things. Israel has still, there's a, but God still has a plan for Israel, still in the future. There's still prophecies to be fulfilled upon Israel. Uh, the nation, that will still happen. I am certain of it. After he's through with our church era, when he decides that's over, then there's a bunch of prophecies that will be fulfilled with Israel. And some along the way. I mean, they're, they're back together again as a nation again after nearly 2,000 years of not being such a thing. And now they're back in the land and they have a flag and they have a government and they're pretty powerful and they're growing all the time. They produce a lot of uh, produce, grown things, uh, lots of it, and technology. They're pretty big on that and God's blessing them again. And so there will be a lot fulfilled in them anyway. Um, the gist is that more than one group was being mentioned here. So to all of you Gentile believers who follow this rule and also the Israel of God. Now if you describe it like that, that hinge pin verse for amillennialism and covenant theology disappeared. And now they don't have a good foundation anymore. So you've got to throw them out the window. Anyway, I'm sorry if you, if you were into one of those ideas and I just destroyed it for you, but you know, you're welcome. Anyway, verses 17 and 18, Finally, let no one cause me trouble, for I bear the, on my body the marks of Jesus. Uh, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit, brothers. Amen. That's how he signs off, his sign-off for this letter. Um, the scars Paul had on his own body from all the troubles and the persecution that he had suffered because of his testimony to Christ. They were like brands on, a, on cattle or, or on slaves. That's what he was saying. My scars because of this are like brands. I bear on my body the marks that I've served him. Um, so they were like the badge of honor for being counted as worthy to suffer for Christ. So anyway, he says uh, these scars as if to say, I've already experienced the worst the world has, so uh, those who want to make trouble for me shouldn't waste their effort or just get in line. Everybody else wants to anyway, right? It's not going to bother him. And then he wishes the blessing of grace on the readers as a sign-off to the letter because with the grace of Jesus Christ, all things are possible. With that, I'll close in prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for your grace. Thank you so much of it. And Lord, thank you for this book that we've just studied through. And, and I ask that every heart here might be moved so that they um, leave here today changed, forever changed. They're not the same as they were when they came in. Uh, they've been touched by your word. They've been motivated by it. And Lord, I ask the blessing of the realization of grace upon everyone who hears me today. And these things I pray through Jesus Christ, my Lord. Y'all be good now, you hear?